makes me see it. You'll notice that I took the back stairs to avoid tripping tonight. I told Caleb I was going to say that as soon as I got up here tonight. Um, a number of you, before the night was over a few weeks ago, sent me a message, go look at this. And I appreciate that really much. And I told him, since you're going to be at a summer series, you won't be there. I can talk about you, and you'll never know. He'll know. But I hope you're doing well today. You know, we're at a time where school's back in session. There's all sorts of things going on, and isn't that just fun? you got to get this list. You've got to get that list. You've got to have these items. You've got to have those items. You've got to pick up this. You've got to donate that. You've got to go get. And you know what? We do all those things because we know that they are necessary. We see the importance in sending our children to get an education and for them to have the supplies that they need so that they can truly succeed in what they're being sent to do. For just a few moments of our time, I want us to center our minds, however, on something that's a little bit different than a school supply drive. For just a few moments tonight, let's look at a church supply drive and let's go around and let's pick up five different things that we need that will help propel us into the future. As a matter of fact, we might want to say it this way, will help us succeed when it comes to eternity. As we're going around the store this evening, let's pick us up a big old load of ears I know that's a little unusual, but it'll make sense in just a minute. As we're going through the store, we've got our list of things that we need. Let's buy some doors. And I promise that's going to make sense here in just a few moments. And we're not going to try to keep them shut. We're going to try to keep them open. Let's go through the store. And as we're picking up things that we need to succeed in our church supply drive, let's pick up a whole trailer load of trust. As we go through that store, let's get a little bit of care. Matter of fact, we might want to say it this way, let's get the biggest box of care that they have on the shelf, and we're going to see why here in just a moment. We're going to see why that's a supply that you and I need as the Lord's church, as his people. And finally, let's culminate tonight with something that I believe is very important. Let's buy tonight some time. Now, you and I know we can't buy time, but there is something that we can do with our time that I promise you will make all the difference as we get into our supply drive tonight for the church. Let's start off by looking at getting some ears, and let's get some ears to hear. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 8. Matter of fact, Luke chapter 8 is one of my favorite scenes of Jesus' teaching. Jesus is teaching here in Luke chapter 8, and you read in verse 5 this, A sower went out to sow his seed. And matter of fact, it has probably been one of the most used illustrations Jesus has ever used in modern repetition of those things. But you get into Luke chapter 8 and you read down to verse 8 and you read these words. Luke chapter 8, read with me verse 8. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear... Let him hear. You can do a phrase study. It's very akin to a word study in the New Testament. And you can see that Jesus uses this phrase approximately 15 different times. He that hath ears, those that have ears, let them what? Hear. You see, what we're trying to do for just a few moments is we're trying to get the supplies that we need. Here's supply number one. Let's pick up a good set of ears. You see, ears are extremely important to us when we're out and about in this world, when we're doing a variety of things. There are things we need to know. There are things that we're told, and we need to be able to hear them. But I want to tell you something about your ears. They cannot just hear only. They cannot just hear only. Tonight, if we chose to do so, we could start in the book of Genesis, and we could read until we finish in the book of Revelation. Now, it would take us more than a night. And though that would be good for us, 
to read it in one sitting and to see all the things that God has done and all the things that God had promised. We need to think about our ears for just a minute. Listen to what Jesus said. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him understand. The number one thing we need to do in this life is we need to spend more time hearing God's Word. Let me illustrate something to you. If the only thing you hear is the nightly news, your life will be miserable. If the only thing that you hear is what you find on social media, then your life is going to be miserable. If the only thing you hear is what somebody else has told you, then you're going to be miserable. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of reading from internet doctors, aren't you? I'm tired of reading from internet politicians, aren't you? If that's all you read, if that's all you hear, if that's all you understand, your life will be miserable. We need to spend more time in our supply drive with ears that understand. Here's what we need to understand. Now, to help us with that, we see what's happening here in Luke chapter 8. You go back up to verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the hour devoured it. Some fell upon a rock, and, and it, as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and, and the thorns sprang up with it and, and choked it out. And other fell on good ground. Get your ears out that understand what God has said. Now I want you to side note with me in the book of Romans. Go with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 is the chapter of the book of Romans that's all about hearing. Matter of fact, it, it's a famous passage. We use it all the time. We, we quote it all the time. We cite it all the time. You know it. I know it. We've all heard it. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of what? By the word of God. This is the same thing that's being illustrated in Luke chapter 8, verse 8. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, let him understand. That's what Paul is trying to get these people to understand. Now, when you go in Romans 10, you go back up to verse 1. These are the words you read. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. How can anyone be saved? No, I'm not talking about the mechanism or the, the, the method that God has provided. What is the first thing you must do? If you are contemplating the concept of salvation, you must hear. What we've got to do in our supply drive is we've got to get us a big load of ears so that we can hear. Now you answer me a question, you answer it in your own mind. Don't raise your hand, don't shake or nod, you just answer it. Here it is. Do you want to go to heaven? I already know the answer. Then you know what we need to do? We need to hear more of God's Word. Now, I find something interesting that Paul does here in this particular chapter. I want you to look with me at verse 15. Verse 15 is a really interesting thing because it's this idea of, of, of preachers being sent out, but, but I want you to see something right in the middle of this verse. It's just, boy, it's, 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 it's ear-catching, if you'll allow me to say it that way. And how shall they preach except they be sent? It is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I want you to see two things. Number one, glad tidings of good things. Do you know what this book is about? Good things. That's what this book is about. Now, are there evil things that are recorded in this book? You're right, there are. Thou shalt not surely die. One of the most evil things that's ever been said. It's recorded in this book. God didn't say it, but but someone tried to make us believe it. And you can go on and on in Scripture and read things where man has fell at the tricks of the devil and see evil things. But what's this book about? It's about life. Jesus said it this way, that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The gospel of good things. But I want you to th see this. this is just, it stands out to me. Uh, how beautiful... How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Is he talking about literal feet? 
I sure hope not. Because I've never looked at my feet and said, boy, how beautiful. Have you? What's the point here? If we have ears to ingest the Word of God, Luke 8, 8, Romans 10, 17, then Romans 10, 15, I'm going to take the gospel of good things and what? Share it with those that I'm around. So here's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to get a big old load of ears to hear God's message so that we can share God's message. Jesus presented this concept about 15 different times in his ministry. So as we go through that first aisle, we pick up our ears. Now, let me give you a side note about ears. We don't just need to hear God's word. You know what else we need to hear? This is, this is free. It doesn't cost you anything extra, okay? We need to hear the needs of our community. We need to hear the needs of our brethren. Don't miss those. Listen, you need to hear what God has said, but you need to hear how you can help both without and within. Get those ears too. Don't miss that. So let's go through the aisles and let's pick up number two, some doors. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't particularly like installing doors. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and tell you the door I dislike the most, the French door. That is a hard door to install. I just don't like that door. A regular door is so much better, but I'm not talking about those kind of doors. Go with me to Colossians 4.3. We're going to see Paul again as he's entering through his ministry, as he's working with the brethren, as he's trying to help throughout the churches. In chapter 3, some interesting, or chapter 4, some interesting things are happening. Matter of fact, it starts out real interesting. Verse 1, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just. Boy, that's an interesting theme. Knowing that you also have a master in heaven. In other words, there's not a single person on the face of this earth that's above God. It's not you. It's not me. He says, verse 2, you've got to continue in prayer and, and watch in the same with thanksgiving. We should be the most thankful and happy people on the earth, but sometimes Christians are the most miserable. Well, that's, that's inaccurate, folks. But listen to verse 3. Colossians 4, verse 3. With all praying also for us, that God would open, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. We need some doors. Paul says, pray that God opens the doors. Now, I want you to see something about Paul. I want you to see this about Paul. Where was he when he penned this verse? He says, I just want to preach the mystery of Christ. You pray that doors will be opened so I can do that. Paul, where you at? For which I am also in bonds. Even at the lowest point that you and I could conceive, I know there were a lot of low points in the life of Paul, but let me tell you, that man was in prison more than he was out. I know that's kind of tongue-in-cheek. But here he was in oppression. We hear a lot about oppression today. By the way, Christians, you're not in oppression today. There's nobody stopping you. Somebody might call you a mean name, but oh, oh you are not in oppression today. You never have been. I pray we never are. Paul was in prison. And what does he pray? I pray that a door of opportunity is before me. You know what we need to do? We need to start praying for doors. And may I add this to this thought? Pray for big doors. Pray for big doors. Don't pray for little doors. Now listen, we need to pray for little doors, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to point out. Pray for something huge. Pray for a giant door of opportunity to land in your life. And guess what? If you're going to pray for a door, if you're going to ask the Lord for a door, be ready to walk through the door because it will be there. Matter of fact, we learned something about this in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was one who cultivated relationships for eternity. That's why in Luke chapter 19, he was able to tell a man who had went up a tree, come on down, we're going to have dinner. That's why Jesus was able to go into the worst places and the most downtrodden areas and feed folks and heal them. That's why Jesus had a ministry unlike any other because he cultivated relationships with people. Those folks are doors. Pray for doors to enter. That's the supply that we need. And what that door is is the door 
of relationships. Now, let me illustrate something to you. God's never going to open a door of a relationship that you don't need. God's never going to send another wife to a married man. God's never going to send a married man to someone else's wife. Those doors will not be opened by God. But God will place us in the lives of people so that we can cultivate relationships that are proper. That's something we need to think about. Doors that we can enter. So as we're picking out supplies, I want us to pick out doors. Let's get number three. Let's pick out, as we pick out some supplies, some trust. Now, we all have to have trust in God. That is true. But, but I want you to see something that God has placed. matter of fact, we could say it this way. This is the church that Jesus built. It's in Hebrews 13, specifically verse 13 or verse 17. Listen to this first word. It's a word we just don't like. Obey. Now, if I were to take a survey tonight to ask you how many, how many of you tonight like the word obey or being told to obey or comply, how many of you would like that? You don't see me raising my hand either. That seems almost contrary to us. But it's not. We'll see this in a moment with the idea of Jesus, but read the rest of the verse. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves to them. For they watch for your souls as they must give an account, for they must do it with joy. Or that they may be do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. What you and I need to understand is Jesus built the church. But let me tell you, Jesus sacrificed for that church. Jesus obeyed the will of the Father for that church. And that, folks, was for you and me. I'm here to tell you tonight that if Jesus could go to the cross, we can obey those that have rule over us. Now, I want to take this in two different areas. Number one, let's talk about the spiritual realm of the church, and then let's talk about, number two, the physical realm. The same is said in First and Second Peter about obeying the government. Matter of fact, the book of Romans also talks about obeying the government. Matter of fact, Jesus even said, render to Caesar the things that be Caesar. What do you think he was talking about? It wasn't just about taxes, folks. Let's talk about the spiritual realm. God has in his design instilled this idea of leaders. It's 1 Timothy 3. It starts out this way. If a man desire the office of a bishop, ah, what a desire. If you could think of noble careers in this world, what would you choose? Well, some people would choose doctors. Many people want their children to be doctors because that's, that's notable, that's, that's respectable in our world. Some people would choose for their children to be lawyers. That's a noble career, maybe a judge, something, something in that realm. And, and, and we believe that's a respectable career. And on and on we could list things that people say, this is notable, this is worthy. Let me ask you a question. And I mean this with all sincerity in my heart. But when have you encouraged someone to be an elder? When have you encouraged your elders? You see, if we're not careful, we're going to be just like the world. Okay, I don't know if you know this or not, but if the world doesn't like you, they'll just cancel you. If the world doesn't like what you're saying, they'll just silence your voice. If the world doesn't like who you're around, they'll just get rid of them too. And if we're not careful, that will infiltrate the church and we'll try to silence what God has given authority. You know what we need in this life? We need some trust and we need to display that trust. Now, I want you to remember this. This is the church that Jesus built. When you hear the word elder, bishop, presbyter, that is the design of which Jesus purposed. We need to, number one, obey those that have rule over us in the spiritual realm. I believe that's the context of Hebrews 13, 17. But, but I want to circle back, and let's see the physical side. Folks, we may not always agree with what our government does. Matter of fact, let's take a poll. This is yes, this is no. Do you always agree with your government? Does that help you? Me either. But who ordained governments in this land? It wasn't man. You go all the way back to the times of the book of Daniel. 
and you will see the rise and the fall of nations. Who is in control of the rise and fall of nations? It's not the nations. Even though nations should play a big part in the rise and fall of nations, there's a simple formula for the rise and fall of nations. When nations distrust God, they fall every time. But let me tell you something here's true. You may not always agree with what your government says, but your Lord told you to respect them and to obey them. That's hard for us, isn't it? It's hard for us, isn't it? And if we're not careful, we're going to take that attitude and we're going to place it into the church and and we're we're not going to worry about what God's servants has said. By the way, thinking about this idea of elders, where do they work? They work in matters of expediency. Elders have no authority in the word. Okay? The elders of the East Hill Church cannot come in here tomorrow and say, we're going to go instrumental. They don't have that authority. The elders cannot come in here tomorrow and say, we're going to hire a female preacher. They can't do that. That's not within their realm of authority. We're all bound by the same word. It's time we understand that and trust it and follow after it. We have trust that we can display. Number, number next, let's give some care. Let's give some care. This is in uh, 1 John chapter 3. This will be our shortest point tonight. Because I want us to understand from 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, that this is the life, or the life of Jesus provides the way. Now, I just want you to read with me to the first comma. But whoso has this world's goods? All right, I'm going to ask you three questions. But whoso hath this world's goods? 1 John 3, 17 and 18. Today, have you had a good meal? All right. Today, have you had clothing on your back? I can go ahead and tell you the answer to that. Y'all good. Today, have, had, have you had the luxuries of this world? I hear the air conditioners rumbling, the lights are on, the screen's running, the microphone's going. We've got the luxuries of this world, don't we? By the way, how many of you drove here in an automobile tonight? I can only imagine one person that might have walked tonight. He, or he, he was laughing. I knew that's what he meant. Butch walked tonight. But how many of us had streets to walk on? (laughs) Then, folks, we have the cares and riches and goods of this world. We live 99% above most of the world. That's hard for us to imagine because we've never seen it, but I promise you, it's there. And this is what he says. But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need... Now, read the next phrase very carefully. And shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. Here's the idea. You see someone, and the context of 1 John 3, 17 is very specific. You see a fellow Christian, and they're in need, and you just so happen to have what they need. And you do this. Then you are lost then you are lost. Every one of us tonight have more than we even desire. And when we see someone who is in need and we proverbially turn our backs on them, the text says we shut our bowels of compassion when we no longer care. Maybe it's because of time we don't care. I don't have time for that today. Maybe it's for money's sake. You know, we always convince, us, convince ourselves we're poorer than we think we are. But you know, money's all about priorities. By the way, think about that fact when you think about your contribution. Money's all about priorities. Just something to think about. But when you say, oh, I don't got enough time. I don't have enough money. I... They never really spoke to me anyways. When we act indifferent, we have shut up our bowels of compassion Now read the next phrase. This is probably more important. How dwells the love of God in him? Now listen to this next phrase. Three words. My little children. My favorite phrase in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Let's not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, the life of Jesus provides the way. Go do a character study of Jesus as he went through the villages and the cities. You know what he did? He went to the downtrodden. He went to the sick. He went to the poor. 
He, he went to those that had nothing, and he offered them life. He fed them. He cared for them. You know what we need when we go through this supply drive? We need a big old helping of care. And finally, as you go to the book of Ephesians, go with me to the book of Ephesians. Let's see, we need to pick up some time. Ephesians 5. I want you to see a phrase that I believe is crucial to when it was written, but bigger now. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Verse 15 of Ephesians 5, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Look at that last phrase. Because the days are evil. Now, when this was penned, the days were evil. How do I know that? Well, Paul wrote. He wrote to people that were living in that time. The days are evil. You know, what, what does that mean? There's evil in our land. Okay, that's still true today. I want you to know, you, you need to understand this, we need to get it. And I'm going to say it in a multi multitude of ways, and I don't mean any way to be worse than the other, but I just want us to see this because we need to understand it. And I'm going to end with one, and you're going to say, no way, y yes way. Number one, there's evil in our communities. If there was no evil there would be no need of a police force. But yet there is evil in our communities. There, are, there is evil. Listen to this one. I'm not trying to start nothing with this. You just need to know it, understand it, and once you accept this, it will help you see the world in a different light. There's evil in politics. I'm not going to explain that. We ain't got the time tonight to explain that, but there's evil in politics now listen to me when I say this one, okay? I certainly don't mean this at anyone in this room or anyone in this community, but you need to know it in a global sense. There's evil in education, okay? Listen, we've got great schools here, and I pray they never go the way of the world. But there's evil in education. From the highest institutions to the lowest institutions, there's evil in education. If you have children... You better know what's being taught in that room. I'm glad to say that we've got great teachers, great staff, wonderful here. We're blessed. But it might not always be that way. There's evil. Redeeming the time. The days are evil. There's evil, number four, in our homes. You're saying, how? This is not the no way part yet. It, we're getting to that. That's the next one. There's evil in our homes. There's evil in marriages. There's evil in parenting. There's evil in being a child. A lot of influences in this world. And they're in the home. There's evil. Here's the fifth one. Redeeming the time of the days of evil. There's evil in the church. No, can't be. Yeah. I heard one man say this, the church would be great if it wasn't for the people. Get it? The church would be great if it wasn't for the people. There's evil in the church. You go read 1 Corinthians 10 and tell me if the church in Corinth had a problem with sin. Problem with pride. I want to give you the number one way there's evil in the church. It's you and me. Church will never be evil from there. But when you and I get involved, evil exists. And it doesn't have to be that way because we can dedicate ourselves to good. There's evil in our own thoughts. There's evil in our own motives. That's probably the greatest way that evil exists in what we want. Individual motives, trying to get this done, creeping in the shadows to do this. There's evil in the church, folks. Don't let it be you. Don't let it be any of us. But he says, you've got to redeem the time for the days of evil. There's evil or potential for evil everywhere. So how, how do you deal with this? What do I do? What do I do? What do you do to understand evil but to avoid evil? 
See then that you walk, listen this way, uprightly. I want, I want to give you a key that will unlock doors in this life. Live like a Christian should. That's it. Live like a Christian should. That's it. That is the secret formula for success. Now, now that, that assumes a lot of things. If a Christian is going to live like he should, what's he got to do? Oh, I've got to present some time to my living, but I've got to present some time to my understanding. That's hard. Because we live in a time, maybe now more than ever. Now, there, there are a few, few things that we can say maybe now more than ever. I, I don't think the world's more evil now more than ever. I think we just hear about it faster than ever before. Matter of fact, there are things that we don't even know that happened in history that we'll never know because the Internet didn't exist. I don't know about you, but I'm really glad that I didn't grow up in the social media generation because, kids, everything y'all do right now is online and you ain't getting rid of it. Aren't y'all glad you, that, that your childhood, that your teenage years, that your young adult years aren't on the Internet? We just hear about it more. But I think now we're faced with more voices than ever before. There are more channels on TV than ever imaginable. There are more phone numbers in existence than ever thought. There are more websites on the Internet than they ever imagined could happen. There are more experts in our world than subjects to be experts on. Let me tell you, that's all fighting for your mind every day. Every day. Then add the externals, or what I call the externals of our lives, the things we like, the things we want, the things we need. And before we know it, we've pushed somebody out. You're never going to push yourself out, okay? You're never going to be pushed out of your life. But if we're not careful, who are we going to push out? Who are we going to push away from? Who are we going to quit listening to? Before we know it, all we hear is evil. He says, walk uprightly. Now listen to this. Not as fools. Now we don't want to be flippant. But let me ask you a question, and I'll know based on your face the answer. Are there fools in our world? Now let me ask you this question. Read the verse. Not as fools, but as wise. Are there wise folks in our world? I hope there are more wise than fools, but I'm afraid we're in a line battle. But there's something you can do about it. You can give time. Go study the ministry of Jesus. And the ministry of Jesus was filled with time for you. For you. For them. For others. And that really leaves an impact on our lives. How did Jesus spend his time? For us. Gives us something about time to give because we've got some. So as we go through those aisles, as we're preparing the things that we need, you know, we're picking up our supplies, getting ready for the future. We need some ears to hear and understand. I need some doors, and I've got to be ready for doors. And I'm telling you, I'm begging you, pray for big doors. Don't dream little dreams. Dream big dreams, because what did Jesus say? For with God, what is, what is impossible? Nothing. We need some trust. Now more than ever, we need trust in those that lead us. We need leaders that follow 1 Timothy 3 and congregations that know the Word of God. We need care. This week, I challenge you, find somebody to care for. Maybe somebody you don't even know. Just show them a little care. Show them a little compassion. That's a supply. And finally, time. How many of us have time? 
don't know how much time we have left, but, but we've got time, don't we? For now. How are we using it? That's a choice that we'll have to make because we're going to pick up our supplies and, and you've got to get yours. I've got to get mine. We've got to get ours. What are you going to pick up in the supply drive? Bryce has picked out a song for us to sing. It's a song to encourage us, for us to think, for us to understand that we might need to come home. Maybe it's you tonight as a Christian. You recognize you don't have the equipment, you don't have the supplies that you need. Well, come on back to God and get them. Maybe it's forgiveness, maybe it's courage, maybe it's encouragement. God has those things if you're willing to come to Him. Maybe you're here tonight and you realize you, you've never become a Christian and you recognize right now it's time to get prepared. Well, well the baptism garments are ready. The baptism towels are ready. We've got a number of other supplies that you might need just in case. And the water. One man said to the one that was studying with him, see, here is water. What's hindering me to be baptized? I'm telling you there's water right there. Let's just find out if it's really there. Do you need to become a Christian tonight? You can. You can follow God's plan. And you can have the supplies you need as we think about the future. I believe the future is bright in a number of areas. But let me tell you, heaven's brighter. And that's what we're pushing for. That's what we're longing for. That's where we're going. So let's get ready. Do you need to become a Christian tonight? You can. You let that be known. And we'll do anything and everything you need. Are you a child of God tonight that needs to come back home? Well, the, the time is now. The song's about to start. Think about it. Let's stand and sing and respond accordingly.